Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felden. Okay, it's good to see everyone here in the studio again today, and for those of you joining us out in television, we just want to welcome you to an informal Bible study, and we've always been encouraged that you write back and tell us that for the first time in your life, that's what you are really doing and enjoying, is to open the Scriptures and study them on your own. I don't claim to have all the answers, and uh, I certainly don't claim to always be 100% right, but uh, if we can just get people to search the Scriptures, then I feel that we've accomplished what the Lord wants us to do. And uh, again, Iris is always reminding me that for the program today, if you write or call, just mention Book 50. And uh, we are in the third set of four programs, and we're in the first program this afternoon. But if you'll just tell us that you want something out of Book 50, why well, it's really easy for the girls to uh, get out what you need. Uh, got an interesting letter the other day. I'm going to have to make reference to it. They're from Canada, and they said the next time you tape, why well, you just welcome us sitting there on the back row. And uh, so for you folks in Canada, that's what we're doing. We just trust that you feel like you're right here with us. All right, I think that's all the announcements. Again, uh, I guess we should let our audience know we put out a little newsletter quarterly. It's nothing profound. I try to keep it where anybody can read it in 10, 15 minutes and... Uh, be through with it, but it does uh, keep you aware of where we'll be in our seminar teaching and uh, various stations around the country. So if you need a uh, newsletter, you uh, contact us and we'll get your name on the mailing list. For others of you who may not appreciate getting it and you'd rather not, let us know and we will gladly take your name off the mailing list. We don't want to waste postage unnecessarily. All right, I think that's all we have to get rolling, and we're going to jump right in where we left off at the end of our last taping, or for those of you who see this weekly, it'll be last week, or someday you'll watch these daily, and then it'll be what you saw yesterday. But whatever, uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 8, and we stopped at verse 9, we're ready to go into 10, but before we go into verse 10, I want to back up, if I may, to... Uh, to verse 7, so we uh, get an understanding of where we left off. Now again, I guess almost every month, at least every fourth program then, or every fifth program, I have to remind my listeners that the book of Hebrews, this letter I think written by the Apostle Paul, is first and foremost directed to Jewish believers, and that's why it's called the Epistle to the Hebrews. Consequently, there is not one word in this whole letter to the Hebrews that is what we would call the body of Christ or the church language. You will find almost nothing that pertains directly to the body of Christ. In other words, you don't see the term, the body of Christ. There is not that emphasis on salvation through faith alone in the death, burial, and resurrection. It's not in here. And there certainly is no reference to pastors and bishops and deacons and elders in Hebrews because, again, it's not directed to the Gentile church. So always be aware of that, that this letter does not address the body of Christ as such. But all the things I trust we've been learning now over these last seven or eight chapters are fundamental truths on which the body of Christ rests. You know, even Romans chapter 3, when Paul says, But now the righteousness of God that has come by our faith in Christ, but it all rests on that which was in the law and in the prophets. So everything is a progressive revelation. And so Hebrews is just another one of those sections of Scripture that even though it's not directly addressed to the Gentile body of Christ, yet it shows us the fundamental truths that were so necessary for our gospel to come about. All right, so now then in chapter 8, starting at verse 7, which we more or less covered in our last half hour, so this is just a quick review, we find that as in all of the book of Hebrews, this is constantly being compared from that which was good, that which in the past, to that which is better, or that which is now. In fact, go back up to verse 6. Maybe back up to verse 6. What's the first two words? But now. In other words, that which was past is past, but now. See, he hath obtained a more excellent ministry. See that constant comparison? 
and by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. See? Better than that which was before, the old covenant, which was established upon better promises. I love this. Oh, I hope people can see that. Yes, the law was good. Judaism was good as far as it went. But now that has faded off and folded up like an old garment. And uh, now we've got things that are far better. All right, now then jumping in at verse 7. For if, conditional, for if that first covenant, the covenant of law, if that first covenant had been faultless, if it had been perfect, then there should be no place for a second. That stands to reason, isn't it? I think I mentioned it in the last program. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's only when something is amiss that we dive into it and make corrections. So Paul says, if the first had been perfect, there'd be no need to correct it. But it wasn't. It was fleshly. It was weak. All right, and then verse 8, for finding fault with them. He said, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will, future, make a new, better covenant and, uh, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, that's not addressed to the church. The new covenant, even in Jeremiah, we're going to look at it after a bit, was never addressed to the Gentile church. It was addressed to Israel, and we'll look at that. All right, and then verse 9, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, that I made uh, the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Well, we went through that explicitly, back there in chapter 3 especially, when we rehearsed their unbelief at Kadesh Barnea. And what did the Lord say? They entered not because of unbelief. And the warning is, even for us then, don't harden your hearts as they did and stay in unbelief. Rather, keep trusting. All right, then... Uh, Coming on down to now verse 10, where we're going to start with something totally fresh. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. In other words, after all the years, 1500 at the time Paul writes this, that after all those years, saith the Lord, I will, future tense, put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will, future, be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now, they haven't been that since way, way back in Old Testament history when the Shekinah glory left the temple, you remember? And God even called Daniel and said, Thy people? Why? Because they were no longer God's people. They had turned away in unbelief. But the day is coming when once again... They will be the people of God. Let's go back to Jeremiah 31, honey. Go back to Jeremiah 31, and let's see this new covenant in its original setting. Jeremiah 31, and starting with verse 31. And then you'll readily see that this has no direct, indirect, yes, but no direct bearing on the Gentile church. <clears throat> this is a covenant that God has made with Israel, not to be fulfilled, of course, until Christ returns. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come. See, this is a promise for the future. The days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. See how perfectly the Apostle Paul quoted this? Now, verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Well, now let's stop and think for a moment. When God gave the law to Israel, and as we're going to see when we get into chapter 9, and he gave them the tabernacle. And the whole sacrificial system of worship. He gave them the priesthood. My, they had everything going for them. God was present, remember, in that pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. And he was present. For 40 years after they had rejected Canaan, he fed them in the wilderness. Provided the water. Provided everything they needed. And yet, what did the nation of Israel do with it? 
rejected it. They spurned him for the most part, see? And so, because of their unbelief, this covenant of law became nothing but a broken covenant, waiting for the day when this new one will take uh, center stage. All right? Now verse 33. But, see, there's that flip side again. Oh, they just scorned the first covenant, walked it underfoot. But this shall be the covenant that I will, and again, I'm emphasizing the future tense of these, that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord. In other words, after those days of unbelief and of breaking the original covenant, the Mosaic law, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, not on tables of stone, but he's going to literally implant it in the heart of every Israelite. And then what will happen? I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now I'm going to just read on because there's some good stuff in here. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. Now, you remember back when Moses gave the law, what was the instruction to every Jew? Teach it and teach it. Memorize it. Memorize it. When you get up in the morning, think on the law. When you go to bed at night, you think on the law. And it was just constantly programmed into their thinking. But, you see, when this becomes a reality, which will be, of course, when Christ returns and sets up that glorious kingdom, then Israel won't have to constantly be reminded because it will just be implanted in their very being. All right, and it'll be no longer necessary that they teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least to the greatest, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, I will remember their sin no more. What a promise. What a promise. Now verse 35. For thus saith the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who divides the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. In other words, the God of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's speaking. And now look at the promise in light especially of the Middle East scenario today. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. And I think, uh, no, I, I skipped 35 and I shouldn't have. Let's go back up. That's a big, a big boo-boo, isn't it? Verse 35, Thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for a light by day, and he gives the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night. All right, now then, if those things should depart, if the sun would suddenly quit shining, if the stars would suddenly fall out of their position, then it's possible Israel would cease to be a nation, but not until. Not until. For 37, for thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured. And what we just hear again in the news this past week, they found another galaxy some billion, trillion years out into space. Well, that's just a magnanimous guess, I know, but nevertheless, what does it tell you? How vast the universe. No human scientific anything can measure it. But God says, if they can, then Israel might cease to be a nation. So it'll never happen. Now, I know most of us who are biblically oriented uh, are real concerned about the situation in the Middle East. It almost looks as though the life of the nation of Israel is slowly but surely being snuffed out. And uh, just reading in the Jerusalem Post again last night where a lot of the Jewish people actually think that. Are they about to lose their country? Are they about to be thrown out for the last time? No, they're not. Now, they're going to be squeezed. They're going to go through some terrible times. And uh, the Old Testament prophesies that it's going to come to the place where they will stand totally isolated, all alone, with no one to help them. But they're not going to disappear. 
And so we can take comfort in that, that the Word of God is steadfast and sure. And uh, they are there. I, I trust they are there as and part of the end time scenario now. And uh, it just tells us that the Lord's coming is getting nearer. You know, uh, I made the big mistake way back in 93. And uh, I thought that by the end of the millennium or by the year 2000, the Lord will return. Well, I didn't set it in concrete, as I say so often, but I shouldn't have even said that much because we, we can't even speculate. So you remember I told you the cartoon that I had seen about the same time the old boy sitting outside his cave door and above he had, had written, the end is near, but then he had second thoughts and he added ER. Remember that? The end is nearer. And so that's the way I leave it today. Yes, the end is nearer than it was yesterday. And it's certainly a lot nearer than it was when Israel first declared themselves an independent state in 1948. But we can see that all the ramifications of the world, the turmoil, the perplexity, the wars. Somebody t called me on the, other, on the phone the other day. And again, I have to respect uh, what people tell me. And uh, I didn't ask for a documentary of it. But he had heard someone give a lecture that right now today there are 50 wars raging around the planet. 50. Well, I knew it was well over 40, the last I read in one of the news magazines. But just think about it. 50 wars are raging. 48 of them involve the Muslim people. And so we, we find ourselves in, in a world that's in turmoil. And it's not just politics. It's just not economics. It's religious. And if you go back into history, you'll find that most of the turmoil all the way back was usually, not always, but usually based on religious differences. But the nation of Israel, in spite of all the pressure, in spite of all the gloom, will never again cease to be a nation. So let me finish verse 37. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured, the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off the seed of Israel for all that they have done. But it's not going to happen because this new covenant is a covenant sent from the eternal sovereign God and he will never go back on his word. All right, let's come back a minute then to Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 8. And then we'll go on to verse 11. I'd like to finish this chapter 8 in this half hour. And now as we go into chapter 11, 11 they, it's coming back to Jeremiah 31, 31. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Now here again, you see, you and I in the human realm cannot comprehend the grace of God, even concerning Israel. My God should have cast them out of his thinking centuries and centuries ago. They have no reason to still be in God's favor. <clears throat> they have been a rebellious people. They've been an ungodly people. In fact, let me take you back another verse. Go all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And it, it just shows the mind of a merciful God. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. And God has never changed. He has never even had a thought of casting away his people Israel. Even as Paul says in Romans 11, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Don't even think such a thing. That even though they had rejected him and crucified him, yet God has not cast away his people Israel. All right, and the promise begins way back here in 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verse 14, where God is addressing King David. And he tells David, that concerning the nation of Israel, I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men. In other words, in another place, Isaiah think, speaks of people coming in with a language that the Jews couldn't understand. In other words, they'd be overrun by their Gentile enemies. But that's not going to stop God. 
He said, I will chasten him with the rod of God, with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. Now verse 15. But, but even though they're iniquitous, even though they are steeped in unbelief, yet God says, my mercy shall not depart away from him. Now, let me take you back to another, and I hope I can find it, in Exodus. All the way back to Exodus. I think it's in chapter 33. Exodus 33. Drop down to verse 19, honey. Exodus 33, dropping down to verse 19. And don't forget these things. These, these are the very words of the eternal God. And nothing that men or nations or governments can ever change. It's set in concrete, as I like to so often express it. Exodus 33, verse 19. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, that is, before Moses. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Now look at it. Here comes the promise. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now, if you remember when we were teaching in Romans several years ago, I used the analogy. It's just like someone who has stepped out in the bright sunlight and these things just come down upon him. But God retreated and he retreated into his sovereignty. Even though men may have just exclaimed, no way. But God retreats into his sovereignty. He is absolute. And in his sovereignty, what does he say? I will show mercy to whom I'll show mercy. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Nobody can change that. He's sovereign. And even though you and I as mortals cannot understand some of these things, yet we have to remember that in His sovereignty, God can do whatever He wants to do, even though we may sometimes think it's ridiculous. And from the human, maybe it is. But all oh, from His sovereignty, never. All right, back to Hebrews again. Chapter 8, and now in verse 12 with what we've just been seeing from the Old Testament. For God says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, even though they've been a wicked and an ungodly nation. If you think I'm stretching the point, you haven't read the Old Testament lately. You go back to the Old Testament and you wonder how God ever put up with it. And never forget, the vast majority then, as now, even though they were religious, they didn't have saving faith. And I'm always going back to Elijah when he confronted the prophets of Baal. That's probably the clearest explanation of the spiritual level of Israel. And here most of Israel had fallen down and worshipped Jezebel's god, Baal. And you know the story. And when Elijah confronted them and the fire from heaven lapped up all the water that Elijah had put on his sacrifices, and God instructed him to kill the prophets of Baal, and he did. But then when the message got to old Jezebel, just about 20 miles to the east in Jezreel, she sent the messenger right back. You tell Elijah that tomorrow at this time, he'll be as dead as my priests of Baal are. And poor old Elijah did what? He ran. And he ran. And he ran. And I always like to make a graphic. He was more than a marathon runner. He was triple that. And he ran all the way to the Negev. Now that's a good hundred miles. And then he gets down under a Jupiter tree, and I imagine he's all pooped out, scared to death. And what did he say? Lord, take my life. I'm the last one left in Israel. Take me and forget about the nation. And what was God's answer? Elijah, 7,000. 7,000 have not bowed their knee to Baal. And we think, well, that's a pretty good chunk of people. 7,000? But listen, out of an average population of 7 million, and you've heard me say this a hundred times, at least in my classes, 7,000 out of 7 million is one-tenth of one percent. Even in Israel. That's all that were remaining true to Jehovah. Well, it's never been much different. At the time of the flood, it was less than that. That was just eight. 
And I feel there were four billion people on the earth at the time of the flood. Eight people, that's all. And now another graphic illustration. It's not quite as, as clear, but I think it's pretty close. And when you get into Acts chapter 1, after the Lord has been ministering to Israel up and down the dusty roads of the little nation, and they come together in the upper room, how many were there? Come on, you all know. 120. 120. Now, I have to feel that that was most, if not all, of the true believers in Israel concerning Christ. 120. After three years of his miracles and his ministry. Well, then we wonder why people don't listen to me or you. It's always been that way. We can never expect the multitudes. I don't. That's why I'm tickled to death if people call and say, well, we're going to get 20 people together. Will you come? Sure, I'll go. Because I'd rather have 20 true believers and who are really concerned as to have a whole stadium full that want to be entertained. But you see, it's always been that way. God has always had to settle for that tiny little remnant. All right, now in the couple minutes we have left, uh, verse 12 and 13. For God says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and their iniquities. I will remember no more. Now stop and think. Can you and I forget something that has happened in the past? Not very likely. Not if it's made an imprint on us. We can try our best, but you cannot forget it. It's there. And as you go through life, something will just trigger it, and there it's back. But what about God? He can. See, God can forget. And that's the precious promise, that when He forgives, He forgets. He doesn't throw up our past. Our old memory will, but God won't. And always remember that, that God doesn't hold, I don't care how black the past, God doesn't hold that against it. He has forgotten it. Well, he did the same thing with Israel. And so then verse 13, in the few seconds that are left, in that he saith, a new covenant. He hath made the first old, like a garment that's ready to be folded up and cast aside. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Well, what's he still trying to impress upon these Jewish people? that the old system of law and the old religion of Judaism is now worn out. It's past. It's done. And they're to look for something totally new. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.